This film is intended for eye surgeons for training and education purposes. Viewer discretion is strongly recommended. Uh, hello friends. What strategies do I follow when I perform fake emulsification in an eye with a discontinuous rexis? Let me demonstrate them through this case. And now this is a 65 year old lady with an intumescent cataract. My plan is to do uh, the two stage rexis. The primary rexis is done and I'm trying to decompress the bag by aspirating the cortex in front and behind the nucleus with my phaco tip. I thought this much of a decompression is good enough and I proceed by giving a tangential cut to the rexis margin and I'm trying to enlarge the rexis. Well, it just runs to the equator. And there are three reasons for it running away. Uh, number one, the decompression of the bag was not good enough. Number two, the inner chamber was not, not deepened sufficiently enough before tearing the flap. And lastly, the anti capsule edge at this quadrant was much closer to the equator. The other quadrant of the rexis was ideal to begin the process of enlarging as it was much away from the equator. So now we have a situation where the rexis is not continuous and so how do we go about now? The first thing I do is to enlarge rexis by snipping at the margin in the other quadrant uh, in the form of a tangential cut so that I can enlarge rexis using a micro forceps. Uh, in this case, I have decided to go ahead with the phaco emulsification. The pupil is well dilated. The nucleus is not soft though, but the good thing is that the edge of the tone and theory capsule is very well visualized and uh, is currently everted and fluttering, which is a good sign. The principle of no hydro dissection and minimal rotation nucleus will be followed. With one eye on the flap, I begin fake emulsification of the nucleus. Before performing the first vertical chop, I am creating a small trench by sculpting the central part of the nucleus. The idea is to get a good purchase of the central core of the nucleus. The first chop is done and as I am laterally separating the fragments, I am conscious to be very gentle with my lateral separation maneuvers. The idea is to prevent any stress on the tone edge of the endocapsule. The second chop is done now and I have a free fragment which I pulled out of the bag and then I am emulsifying it. In a routine case, I usually divide all the pieces in the bag before emulsifying them one by one. But in this case, the idea is to create more place in the bag, which in turn is beneficial as less stress is induced on the tone edge of the anti capsule because there is more space within the bag. The emulsification of the quadrant is being done in the anti chamber and completed. Now the nucleus is rotated gently and the subsequent vertical chops are done to divide the hemi-nucleus into two more smaller fragments. These two fragments are being emulsified in a controlled manner. As can be clearly seen here, the plane of emulsification is much more anterior than what I would have liked but the circumstances are such that emulsifying it in a much more anterior plane is a safer option. Before coming out, I inject OVD through the side port to prevent any shallowing of the anterior chamber. Now, we want to maintain the anterior chamber equilibrium at every step of the surgery. That's very critical in such situations. The second hemineucleus is then divided into smaller fragments and then each of them is emulsified in a controlled manner. OVD is again injected through the side port before coming out. There is very little cortex which is then aspirated out. The 
OVD both in front and behind the lens is irrigated out. The irrigating cannula goes behind the IOL to irrigate out the trapped OVD. It's ensured that the haptics are away from the area of the toned rexis before closing. The wounds are hydrated and that's it, the case is done. And this is a picture on the first post-op day. As expected, there is some amount of corneal edema. This is primarily because of the anterior plane of emulsification which was done in this case. So to summarize, a discontinuous rexis creates a weak area in the anterior capsule opening and it carries a risk of a wraparound tear extending to the posterior capsule during nucleus manipulation and carries a high risk of nucleus dropping into the vitreous. In the event of a discontinuous rexis, the decision to perform FACO or to convert to ECC or SICS should be purely based on the experience and skill levels of the surgeon and the density of the nucleus and the visibility factors in that particular case. Now, if I decide to continue with FACO, uh, here are the seven principles I would like to follow. The first thing I would like to do always is to enlarge the other quadrant of the rexis especially if the capsular opening is very small to begin with. By enlarging the capsular opening, uh, it will ensure lesser stress on the back during nucleus manipulation, especially during division of the nucleus. Typically, I avoid hydrodissection and minimize nucleus rotation in eyes which have a discontinuous rexis. The third most important principle is to ensure that the chamber equilibrium is maintained at every moment of the surgery. This is probably one of the most critical aspects because sudden shallowing or sudden deepening of the chamber is going to extend the torn edge of the anterior capsule beyond the equator and into the posterior capsule. While performing a fake emulsification, I ensure that I keep a close watch on the tone flap at every moment of the surgery. If the flap is mobile, fluttering and inverted, then it's all good. This is the flap modality sign. However, if the flap is stiff, inverted and not moving at all, then it is not a good sign. It's indicative of an, the tear having extended beyond the equator into the posterior capsule. During nucleus chopping maneuvers, lateral separation has to be very gentle to minimize any stress on the torn edge of the anterior capsule. After the first chop is done and the first fragment is created, invariably I pull it out of the bag and emulsify it first. This helps in creating space within the bag which ensures that there is lesser stress on the weak capsular margin. And finally, the fragment emulsification is done in the anterior chamber above the anterior capsular plane. Hence, it becomes mandatory for us to protect the endothelium by using adequate amount of good dispersive OVD. So these are the seven principles which I try to follow when I'm performing fake emulsification in an eye with an incomplete rexis. That's it. Hope you found this helpful and thank you for watching.